Yesterday evening, a catastrophic storm moved through Houston, Texas. Here's a look at the outages in Houston this afternoon. Almost a quarter million people without power in Northwest Houston. The outskirts, the Northeast side also pretty heavily hit. What caused that? Well, we're gonna take it back to 4 p.m. yesterday. Here's Austin, here's Houston, and this is the storm we're gonna watch. So going forward from 4 to 4.30, this tracks right along the US 290 corridor, and you can see it's starting to develop some severe structure right in here. That's gonna be an updraft area, kind of a weak echo region at the surface, a concavity. And just south of there, some Boeing evident with that cell. And you can see the tornado warning's already up. And as that heads into the Giddings and uh, what city is that? Brenham area, it does start to look supercellular. So this is gonna be about 4.30. It's already starting to look pretty ominous. And we continue with the final approach into the Houston area. This appears to be a combination bow echo and supercell. The main updraft area right there, very strong rear flank downdraft bow echo right there on the south side. And that continues marching into Houston. Tornado warning's up already. And there it goes. Take that a little bit further to the southeast and zoom in. And this is where most of the wind damage occurred. And there were tornadoes along the northern periphery. So there it goes, right into downtown Houston about 6.30 p.m., and then continuing to the southeast towards Galveston Bay. And it got very dark as those storms rolled in. People aren't really talking too much about the echo tops, but these were some massive storms, anywhere from 58 to 62,000 feet, 12 miles of cumulonimbus depth, helping to blacken the sky as these storms rolled in. And of course, where it all counts is on the velocity imagery. We're just gonna take a look at the standard velocity. This is gonna be ground relative, so we're not really compensating for the storm motion, but you can see already a meso coming together there near Hempstead. A little bit of aliasing artifacts right there, but clearly some very strong circulations going on in the storm. I think that is a valid tornado signature and then we see kind of a meso there, maybe a little bit of strong shear right up to the north. And as that rolled into the Houston area, we started to get those tornado reports coming in. The major damage really started about then. And we also got this very strong area of blue. That's going to correspond to, uh, let's see, I don't know if you can see the scale here. That's going to be about 80 to 90 knots inbound. So that's going to be associated with the very strong straight line winds just coming in like a knife right into Northwest Houston. And I'll just take you through the rest of the sequence there. Don't really see a TVS. That's the area we would look right there along 290, but brief, intense tornadoes, definitely possible. And some of those will be undetected. To me, this appears to be a lot of straight line wind damage, but of course the final determination will be from the damage surveys. So I think this is a mix of severe straight line wind damage and intermittent isolated tornado activity. And of course, extensive damage to the transmission infrastructure. Lots of photos like this coming out of Houston. So it is gonna take probably weeks to get everybody reconnected. Anyway, let's move on to today's weather. We are looking at a lull in the weather patterns today. There is still activity in the Gulf Coast region, numerous showers and thunderstorms there with a multitude of boundaries on the coast and the tail end of that frontal boundary right there in South Texas. You can see that there is not onshore flow into Texas and Louisiana. The flow is kind of chaotic and uh, it's gonna probably take another day or two to recover. The dry line also not really set up, but in Colorado and New Mexico, lee side troughing starting to get set up as the next Pacific weather system approaches. Another strong one coming in from Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Numerous wind advisories out through Montana. High wind warning for Idaho City 
out there in the eastern part of Idaho. And you can see that strong cold air advection. Temperatures in the 60s and 70s with winds gusting to 42 knots. That's going to be in Pocatello and another 42 knot reading in Missoula, Montana. We head out to the Pacific and there we have a Pacific High, which is a warm season pattern. 1030 millibars on that. Then going up into Alaska, looks like a weak southerly flow pattern, mostly in the western part of the state, and a little bit of a north flow near Yukon. Some of that heating starting to set in, temperatures in the 60s in the Yukon interior, but it remains cold in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. 20s and 30s persist with a cold easterly flow off of Hudson Bay. Some of that cold air coming into the Canadian prairies, wrapping around this cyclone in Saskatchewan. Temperatures in the 40s and 50s in that area. And we can see by the thickness patterns, the red lines, that tells us that this frontal system will be tracking pretty much right into Ontario and Quebec and maybe dragging that cold front southeast into the Dakotas and the Northern Plains. We check out the mid-tropospheric chart, and what we see here is an active northern stream coming to the Pacific Northwest and then heading into the Great Lakes area. The strongest flow is... Hmm, something fell upstairs. Strongest flow right there in the northwestern U.S., 50 to 60 knots across Washington. And looking at the surface chart, that area of strong winds right there in that area of cold air advection, the troughing, and then downstream from that trough, that's where we find the active weather at the surface, the pressure falls, the low pressure areas. And we tend to find that low pressure area pretty close to the inflection point, downstream from the trough, upstream from the ridge and the upper levels, right in between along the axis of that polar front jet. So this is pretty close to a textbook presentation. The moisture, yeah, there's plenty of that. I started this chart at 1 in the morning last night because this is in advance of that Houston weather system. You can see the very juicy air out ahead of it, 2 to 2.5 inch precipitable water, very damp, very humid, very sultry. And this is, uh, I'm not sure what parallels there are, probably the Iowa derecho back in, was that 2020, August 2020, and also the Mayfest storm in Fort Worth back in May 1995. That was another strong outburst event with quite a bit of hail along with that. So definitely some parallels. And when you have those east-west boundaries this time of year, ample precipitable water, very high instability, high decape, all of that is a very potent recipe for downbursts and derechos. So before we lose the data, I want to go back to yesterday's event, looking at the 18Z high resolution rapid refresh. Let's take a look at the evolution of that Houston storm. Yeah, it's got a complex sinking southeast into the Houston area. Let's try to find a good proximity sounding. We're going to go to that Theta E product and get up there into the late afternoon. Try to find a good parcel that's not affected by contamination. So I'm going to go probably right in here, yeah, around Houston about 6 p.m. It's probably about as good as we're going to get. Now you can see that Omega really high. It looks like some contamination there. Let's back that up just a little bit. Yeah, let's uh, do 21Z, 4 p.m. for the Houston area. I think that's a pretty good proximity sounding. We do see significant curvature in the wind field, mostly from 0 through 3 kilometers, not 0 through 1. Some strong bulk shears up to about 100 knots at 200 millibars. Some steep lapse rates in the mid-levels. And very rich moisture. 70s dew points all the way up to about 2,000 to 3,000 feet. D capes, 1,000, those are very high. The capes running anywhere from 2,000 to 4,500. So a lot of good factors coming together. And all we needed was some sort of boundary. And I'm not sure we have enough data to ascertain whether a boundary was present. Yeah, we're not going to see much in the low level field. It looks overcast across much of that area. We go forward through the afternoon and can't really see anything. The radar also not really showing anything evident. 
you know, a lot of questions here. I would probably look at the surface data next. And, you know, we could spend an hour or two here going over the data. But what I'm trying to do is show you some things to look at and show you how these boundaries and other processes can be very subtle. I mean, we have a lot of days with these same types of SKUTs, the same type of MCS ev evolution. So what is it that distinguishes this event specifically from other events? That's a big question. And I think we're going to see a lot of journal articles over the next couple years looking for the answers to those problems. As those boundaries weaken at the surface and the pressure gradients relax, we need to look at the upper levels to see what's going on. And we definitely have strong flow in the upper levels. You can see one major trough right there in Texas and into northern Mexico, a strong northern stream. This here associated with strong cold air advection at the, into the Pacific Northwest and another frontal system in Ontario. So let's take a look at this and see what the forecast is going to bring. A little bit of ridging moving across the Four Corners area. We've not seen much ridging this year, so we'll probably get a temporary break in the activity through much of the Southern Plains, a little bit of drying, and then we start to see these short waves moving in from the Pacific. Those are going to affect mostly the Central Plains. So it looks like Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri may be starting to see some thunderstorm activity. Then Tuesday, a major short wave moving in from the southwestern U.S. Another strong wave for Wednesday. More troughing out west. So it looks like we may have several days of storm activity in the central and northern plains for next week. And with that ridging building in, we're going to see those temperatures really coming up early next week. There's Saturday. There's Sunday. You can see 100s popping up for the Pecos River Valley. Monday, 104 around Ozona, 106 around Del Rio. And on Tuesday, that heat just kind of settling there into the Rio Grande Valley. Much colder weather in the Northern Plains and the Rockies. You can see a high of 64 there for Denver on Tuesday. Let's go ahead and look at that forecast. Things will be dominated by this Pacific weather system sinking through the Rockies and Northern Plains. Numerous boundaries through the southeastern U.S. that will allow for a slight risk of severe weather for Saturday, focusing on the coastal Carolinas down into southern Georgia and northern Florida. Close proximity to that rich, undisturbed tropical air with the boundaries close at hand. Then we go into Sunday. This frontal boundary stalling out across Kansas and Colorado, so we will see a slight risk of severe from eastern Nebraska into central Kansas, maybe even further west into the western part of Kansas as well. Then we're looking at a couple days of thunderstorm activity, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, active in Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, and you can just kind of follow your favorite area there. Deep low in northwestern Oklahoma for early Wednesday, and that will drive some of that activity into the Ohio River Valley, the Ozarks, and Arkansas for Thursday. A new system coming in for the weekend next week. That's a little bit beyond the range of our crystal ball, so we'll check in on that for next week and see how things are progressing. 4 p.m. Friday, before we close this up, this is the latest update out of Houston. Over a half million people without power in the Houston metro area, a large chunk in the northwest part of the city. And I think a lot of the people in the middle class and upper class suburbs, they're probably doing okay. But of course, I do have a lot of concern for the lower income people, the elderly. I think this is going to be very hard on them. So hopefully, we get that power restored pretty soon. But it is a mess. A lot of infrastructure is down. These are the high tension lines around Houston, and I don't know exactly which ones are out, but basically this entire corridor, as far as I know, these lines here probably heavily hit, if not destroyed. 
And of course, a lot of the neighborhood infrastructure that has to be worked on too. So I think this is probably going to end up being a five to ten billion dollar disaster. Definitely way up there in the record books. All right. With that in mind, we'll check back in on things on Monday. Monday will be a supporter video, so if you want to get signed up for that, head to our Patreon link. Otherwise, we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Hope you have a great weekend. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.